Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our webinar. I'm Kate Tracy, Communications Coordinator at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, or SACE. Over the next hour, SACE technical staff will cover our second annual Energy Efficiency in the Southeast 2019 report released earlier today. The report is available for download at our website, cleanenergy.org. Following the webinar, we will send a link to the recording. A couple of technical items. This is a visual webinar. If you are calling in from your phone, I encourage you to call back in using the Zoom link. Aside from presenters, all lines will be muted. We've also saved time at the end of the webinar to answer questions. During the, during the presentation, you can submit questions by clicking on the Q&A box and typing your question. If you're unfamiliar with our organization, the Southern Lines for Clean Energy is a regional nonprofit that promotes responsible energy choices. Not only does SACE put out various reports throughout the year like this one, we also intervene on energy policy and advocate to decarbonize the Southeast in an equitable way. Today's discussion will be led by report authors, Forrest Bradley Wright, SACE's Energy Efficiency Director and Energy Policy Manager, Heather, Pon Heather Ponin. To start things off, Heather will go over the scope of the report. It looks like we're having a slight technical difficulty, so we'll get it started in just one minute with Heather. Thanks for your patience. Oh, we're muted. <laughs> Sorry for that. Thank Can you, you hear that. us? Okay. Um, so everyone, thanks for joining the webinar and thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Um, I'm Heather Ponin, Energy Policy Manager at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. I'm one of the authors of this report, along with Boris Bradley Wright, who is SACE's Energy Efficiency Director. Um, so Kate gave a little introduction to SACE, but for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that promotes responsible energy choices to ensure clean, safe, and healthy communities throughout the Southeast. Uh, and as a leading voice for energy policy in our region, uh, SACE is focused on transforming the way that we produce and consume energy in the Southeast. And one of those transformations is energy efficiency, which is the topic of today's webinar. Uh, so the content of this webinar is based on SACE's latest energy efficiency in the Southeast annual report, uh, which documents recent trends in energy efficiency programs offered by utilities. So uh, over the next hour, we're going to describe and take questions on both utility and state trends, uh, and also identify the policies and practices that impact energy efficiency uh, resource adoption in southeastern utilities. Uh, now, this report looks at each utility's energy efficiency savings as a percent of prior year retail sales. Uh, this metric is widely used uh, in states that set energy efficiency resource standards, but it's also a practical way to compare uh, utilities of different sizes. So all the way from large investor owned utilities to smaller municipal or cooperative utilities. And SACE's general approach to evaluating um, each utility's energy efficiency portfol portfolio uh, is to get the most detailed data available and to standardize uh, that data. So the savings that you see throughout the report and webinar uh, come primarily from annual energy efficiency reports that utilities are required to file by state regulators. Uh, in most cases, these align with other data sources, uh, but in some cases, utilities choose to exclude certain programs uh, when reporting to federal data sources, such as the Energy uh, uh, Information Administration. And uh, one other quick note is that when we refer to southeastern utilities or southeastern states, uh, we're talking specifically about utilities that do not participate in interstate electricity markets like PJM or MISO uh, because they're regulated differently. So you might see uh, references to those utilities just as a point of comparison, but they are not included in regional or state totals. So just keep that in mind as we move on to the next slide. Okay. So we're looking at the performance of southeastern states uh, along with some information on how the region stacks up on a national level. 
So Tennessee, Mississippi, and Florida all had savings levels that were far below the regional average. And as a result, uh, energy efficiency performance in the Southeast uh, really trails the rest of the country, such as the Midwest or the Northeast, uh, in delivering annual efficiency savings uh, that are about three or four times higher than they are uh, in the Southeast. Um, and on the other uh, end of the spectrum, just three states ex uh, exceeded the regional average, and that's Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And in particular, North Carolina uh, continues to be the only state in uh, the Southeast that exceeds the national average as well, uh, did last year, um, and is delivering savings on par with other leaders in the country. Um, so now that we've looked at how the states stack up relative to their size, we're going to take a look at how the total savings numbers looks and note a few differences there. Okay, so now we're looking at how each state's actual savings, the total number of savings, look in the context of all the savings in the Southeast. So North Carolina still ranks as number one in this context as well, uh, but one other difference from the previous slide that I wanted to highlight um, is the similar savings levels for Florida and South Carolina. Uh, despite Florida being by far the largest state in the Southeast, its contribution to the total regional savings is only just barely higher than South Carolina's. And so there's also a fairly steep drop off after those top four states, uh, with Alabama and Mississippi contributing just a fraction of the total savings in the Southeast. Uh, but since there are a fair amount of utilities um, in the region, we're going to focus on um, just the top um, few producers uh, as we move to the next slide. Uh, so this grouping of utilities um, pretty much represents about 99% of savings in the Southeast. And as we look at the performance of these utilities, one thing to keep in mind is that 1% uh, of prior year retail sales um, is a symbolic benchmark uh, for utility energy efficiency. And um, to date, Duke Energy Carolinas is the only utility in the region to exceed that benchmark. Uh, and this is, in fact, the second year in a row that we've been able to do so. Um, one other Duke company, Duke Energy Progress, uh, which also operates in North and South Carolina, didn't quite meet this benchmark, but they're still well above uh, the next major um, they're still above the rest of the southeastern utilities. Um, and uh, the, other Duke com uh, the other Duke utility, Duke Energy Florida, uh, is well below those other two. And it's mostly due to state policy differences that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation. And so the next uh, kind of grouping of utilities uh, we're looking at is Georgia Power and Tampa Electric. Uh, which both exceeded the regional average, but still fell uh, kind of short of that national average. Um, and apart from that, uh, all other major southeastern utility systems are substantially underperforming. So even though uh, TVA in Florida and Power and Light are two of the largest utilities in the region, um, they're still kind of uh, driving that overall savings um, average downwards. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to the next slide and just kind of look at the total breakdown by utility. Um, and it should be readily obvious that um, Duke accounts for most of the savings. It's uh, well over half in the region. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that um, that Force is going to go over in a little bit. Um, but the next largest contributor is Southern Company, which is made up of Georgia Power, Mississippi Power, and Alabama Power. Um, there is actually quite a bit of difference between those uh, individual operating companies uh, that we're going to go through uh, in a little bit. And uh, finally, to contrast, uh, again, uh, Florida and Power Lights, which is the largest utility in the region, actually still comes in towards the bottom of the pack in this ranking as well. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to actually uh, go over uh, hand this over to Forrest, who is going to give an in-depth look at some of these utilities, starting with Duke. Yeah, thank you so much, Heather. Um, indeed, over the next section, we'll be looking at individual utilities and states, starting with Duke. As Heather noted, it is the clear leader um, within the Southeast. Duke Energy Carolinas being the only utility to have exceeded the 1% uh, threshold that she mentioned. 
Duke Energy progress at 0.86% uh, is still head and shoulders above the next utilities and, and far above uh, the remainder of, uh, of utilities throughout the region. There are a few things that uh, help explain the uh, success that Duke has had in this area. Um, certainly there are supportive policies, particularly in the Carolinas. You do see a very large distinction between uh, the performance of Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Florida, as Heather noted. Um, there are major policy factors that uh, constrain uh, savings in Florida that I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but uh, the other big factors that we see as, uh, as leading to the, the higher level of achievement Duke has uh, attained um, relate to management leadership. This clearly has been made a priority within the company and a robust internal staff that oversees efficiency across all six of the states where Duke operates um, that is able to bring experience uh, across these, uh, these state and, and operating company lines um, to, uh, to, to really strive uh, for higher performance. Um, additionally, the company has shown itself very willing to pursue continuous improvement. And uh, this is important because in um, their most recent uh, utility filings, the company has projected declines uh, for each of uh, their utilities. Um, Duke Energy Carolinas uh, showing a, a potential 20% decline, Duke Energy Progress a 9% drop, and an even more precipitous drop at the already low uh, efficiency savings levels um, in Florida. To help counteract that, um, Duke works with a group of um, stakeholders that uh, are advocates for energy efficiency in what's called the, uh, the collaborative. Um, the group's overall efforts aim to identify additional program and saving opportunities to help the company maintain, reach, and, and exceed that 1% savings. Um, one other thing of note, uh, low income energy efficiency is uh, a priority um, for energy efficiency advocates across the region. Um, Duke uh, in Florida, despite the lower uh, overall performance, has made low income energy efficiency uh, a priority and delivered significant savings um, to, to their customers. More than 20,000 customers served um, in, uh, in this uh, reports uh, findings for 2018. Um, with that, I'm going to shift us over to Georgia. Uh, again, as Heather noted, uh, it is the uh, next highest performing of the major utilities, uh, but far behind uh, Duke at this point. Um, you can see them at 0.48%. Um, there will be an expected increase in the next three years following uh, some significant leadership by the uh, Georgia uh, Public Service Commission and, and particularly Chairman um, Bubba McDonald, leading to a 15% increase over the next three years, and importantly, a shift in how energy efficiency will be analyzed in future integrated resource planning with the expectation that any proposed supply additions will be required to compete directly against energy efficiency resources. Um, so this is, Again, uh, an indication there's still significant room for improvement, but this progress in Georgia has, has certainly been refreshing. Um, some of those areas for improvement include aligning the company's resource planning with um, their own corporate emissions reduction goals. We did not see that uh, reflected in their most recent integrated resource plan. And uh, to reach those emissions reduction goals, efficiency is certainly a very valuable uh, resource. Um, there are some uh, significant gaps in uh, Georgia related to where energy efficiency uh, investments are being targeted and, and savings captured. Um, you uh, see that the industrial sector is really not included in uh, Georgia Power's efficiency um, programming. Um, despite having about a third of the overall potential, um, as uh, reflected in, in the company's own um, demand side management potential study analysis, uh, you also have uh, 375,000 
mobile home manufactured home uh, households uh, that do not have targeted efficiency programs. And you know, not only are these customers that from a financial standpoint would significantly benefit uh, from efficiency savings, but it also represents a clear opportunity um, for uh, you know, increasing savings in the state overall. Um, finally, there is a, an enormous chasm um, between the performance of uh, George Power and um, the, the co-op and municipal utilities throughout the state, um, where you can see, again, Georgia Power is the only one above the state average, uh, also above the regional average, where uh, Oglethorpe, TVA, and municipal utilities are far, far below it. Um, so, you know, the Public Service Commission does not um, directly regulate efficiency for uh, those utilities, and um, unfortunately, uh, we've not seen leadership to uh, make up for that uh, at the local level. Next, uh, draw the contrast with Alabama and Mississippi. Um, here on the left, you see uh, Georgia Power's uh, annual performance, again, generally in between the, the 0.4 and 0.5% range. Mississippi Power is less than half of that. Alabama has nothing to show um, for uh, efficiency. And um, when, when comparing uh, the, the performance of, of Southern Company and Entergy in Mississippi, you see a, a story where you have utilities that clearly are capable of delivering uh, effective efficiency programs, um, but in Mississippi, they simply are not receiving uh, the benefit of those, uh, of the experience in other uh, states. So um, there has been a shift uh, in policy in Mississippi recently, they had quick start efficiency programs for several years that have now been wrapped into integrated resource planning. Um, new rules enacted in Mississippi this, uh, this past uh, fall. And uh, that shows promise uh, for some significant improvements uh, around efficiency in, in future years, but will certainly require uh, ongoing uh, engagement from stakeholders and uh, oversight from commissioners. Integrated resource planning is really only as good as the uh, the level of commitment that um, that uh, all parties bring to the table. Um, next, uh, we'll go to Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, again, following the the theme of integrated resource planning, TVA was one of the first utilities in the country to uh, prioritize analyzing efficiency as part of resource planning way back in 2011. But performance has consistently fallen short of plans. Uh, bringing it up to 2019, the most recent TVA IRP took a significant turn for the worst with uh, energy efficiency using unrealistic cost and spending caps that you can see had a dramatic effect on uh, the, the proposed efficiency savings for coming years. Um, the, effect of that on the ground has been that funding has been slashed for efficiency in recent years. There um, are no longer customer uh, rebate incentives uh, available in, uh, in TVA's uh, uh, services, and, uh, and that is really a disappointing turn. Um, you can see in the upper left corner that they're at 0.17%. Uh, um, of annual efficiency savings, so it, it's, it is disappointing. Um, they do prioritize low income energy efficiency, which is certainly much needed. However, uh, TVA does trail other utilities in the region in terms of their scale of investment. There are huge wait lists uh, where um, programming is available uh, and there are requirements in order to access TVA funds for low income programs that local utility companies come up with other sources of matching funds, which can be uh, difficult in, uh, in the way that some of those utility companies are, are structured in their relationship with TVA. Moving on to um, Florida. This graph is showing the uh, results of the three most recent uh, cycles of energy efficiency target setting before the Public Service Commission. Um, every five years, uh, the Florida Energy Efficiency Conservation 
Innovation Act efficiency targets are set for the largest utilities. And you can see that uh, from 2010 through 2014, uh, the commission had ordered substantially higher efficiency savings than the utilities themselves had proposed. You do see actual performance um, at those higher levels, then dropping precipitously when the commission uh, reduced their requirements starting in 2015. Um, there is a, a, a number of major policy uh, issues that are essentially unique to Florida um, in this regard. Um, one is the use of the ratepayer impact measure test as the primary cost effectiveness screening test, the only state in the country to do so uh, when setting targets, which eliminates virtually all efficiency measures. The second is that energy efficiency measures with a two-year or faster payback are excluded. Also, the only state in the country to do that. It eliminates many of the most effective uh, efficiency resources. And ultimately, these targets are supposed to be based on potential, the, the achievable potential based on uh, what is technical and economically uh, available. And I think when you look at that trend line on the actual achievement, you can see there is a, a, a real um, divergence between what is, is actually uh, available in potential um, and what is happening at a policy level. This most recent cycle um, in 2019, utilities proposed slashing their savings even further with many of the utilities proposing to have goals of zero, no savings targets whatsoever or near zero. Uh, for instance, uh, Florida Power and Light had um, proposed one gigawatt hour of savings over 10 years, um, which you know comes in at, at the energy use equivalent of seven homes. So for a utility with uh, you know, well over 4 million customers, um, that really constitutes essentially zero um, commitment to, to energy efficiency. Um, we do also have a significant uh, need for uh, efficiency to low income um, households. Um, there are more than 5 million uh, customers that uh, fall into the category of being at or below 200% of the federal poverty line. That's 37% of the population. And here too, you see a significant divergence actually between the utilities in Florida, um, where the, uh, the better performing like Duke and Tico uh, are delivering savings um, to their customers, you know, in the, 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 the many thousands, um, with Tico doing more than 7,000 uh, customers in 2018. Duke, as I mentioned earlier, over 20,000 uh, customers. Um, both of those vastly exceeding what uh, Florida Power and Light, for instance, has been providing um, with Duke's performance adjusted for utility size 20 times higher than Florida Power and Light's um, uh, efficiency savings for low-income customers and Tico's 50 times higher. Um, so, you know, the need is, uh, it is pretty similar across the utilities, but the performance is very, very different. Next, we'll go to North Carolina, which is still the region's clear efficiency leader. Um, at 0.77%, uh, they do exceed the national average, um, you know, much higher than any of the other uh, states in their, uh, in the region as well. Um, there have been uh, many years of supportive policies, including efficiency being part of the renewable energy portfolio standard in the state, um, the utility being able to earn performance incentives associated with delivering uh, uh, efficiency savings to their customers. Um, but you definitely have a very strong um, uh, effect from, from Duke Energy. Um, as a, a company, again, they're above the state average. Um, if you took them out, the state average would actually be 0.22%. So the, the leadership uh, position that North Carolina um, holds is, is definitely tied both to its own policies, um, but clearly it also is the performance of, uh, of Duke as a company. There is um, momentum uh, for increased uh, pursuit of, of clean energy and efficiency in North Carolina. Uh, you can see on the right, 
there have been several recent developments in the push to reduce um, carbon emissions, including October 2018, Governor Cooper's Executive Order 80, with the aim of reducing North Carolina's greenhouse gas emissions uh, 40% by 2025. Uh, in line with that, the North Carolina Utilities Commission has uh, placed new requirements for Duke in integrated resource planning, including how efficiency is modeled, um, ensuring that clean energy, including efficiency, competes with existing coal uh, generation, um, and wanting to see the resource plans reflect both the uh, governor's uh, emissions reductions targets as well as um, Duke's own corporate emissions reductions targets, wanting to see that uh, presented. Um, and with regard to that last, uh, September 2019, Duke announced plans to cut its emissions 50% by 2030 and reach net zero carbon by 2050 across all of their companies. So again, North Carolina has been the leader, is uh, in a strong position to maintain that. Um, and you'll see that both uh, Duke and um, North Carolina have had an effect uh, that uh, is uh, perceptible in South Carolina as well. So, uh, you know, in addition to um, Duke's operations, um, which, you know, have, as you can see from the chart on the right, uh, really been the driver for uh, South Carolina having the second highest performance for states in the Southeast. Um, you also have a, a political situation following the, the failure of the VC summer nuclear power plant project uh, that has had significant political uh, repercussions. There's been change uh, in the composition of the Public Service Commission and action by the state legislature uh, to pass the Energy Freedom Act in, in 2019 that has policy supportive of energy efficiency. So there is uh, you know, some momentum there, uh, a bit of a different political landscape uh, than in years past. Um, with that, we've seen uh, Dominion, South Carolina, uh, formerly uh, South Carolina Electric and Gas, um, propose and, and receive approval from the South Carolina Public Service Commission to roughly double the efficiency savings that they have achieved in recent years. You have yet to see Santee Cooper come forward with a, uh, a energy efficiency plan um, that we would certainly hope to see. But uh, on the right, you can see the, the performance uh, reflected where Sandy Cooper is, is far behind uh, even, even Dominion, uh, much less uh, Duke. So with that, I'm going to broaden us out, bring us uh, to why we're doing energy efficiency in the first place. We all know that energy efficiency is a least cost energy resource. That means that it is key to lowering energy bills for customers. Uh, it also has the potential to uh, reduce carbon emissions um, by eliminating energy waste that otherwise would need to be supplied with uh, power generation. And much of the uh, power generation in the Southeast is still coming from fossil fuels. There is another movement um, that can reduce emissions uh, that is related to but distinct from energy efficiency, and that's energy optimization and, and specifically electrification. So uh, some of the specific examples of, uh, of how electrification can be um, a, a driver for, uh, for reducing emissions, you see switching from gas um, to electricity for heating homes, businesses, or water heaters, stoves, and clothes dryers. Um, there are smart technologies that can help to optimize energy use, uh, as well as um, advanced metering, um, both the, the kind that is, is being rolled out uh, to, to customers um, where uh, you know, their bills are being set, but also sub-metering. Modernization of building codes and standards is another place where uh, you see a, a move to energy optimization and uh, and then a shift from um, gas transportation um, to uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so there are many benefits um, to electrification. Electrification itself uh, reduces emissions because there is uh, less pollution intensity associated with uh, power from electricity than from um, gasoline and direct-to-customer uh, natural gas. Um, uh, 
but you can also combine um, energy efficiency and electrification. In essence, as electric loads uh, increase with a shift from uh, these other uh, uh, non-electric uses, uh, which can be a, a real win for um, utility companies, uh, by the way, um, efficiency in renewables can um, be part of that, uh, that the strategy to meet that increased load and in that way further reduce emissions requirements. Um, our uh, final slide uh, is looking at the direct relationship between uh, wasted energy and the need for power generation. The Southeast has low energy performance uh, across most of the, the states and, um, and utilities, uh, and yet there are among the highest energy bills in the country in our region. You have utilities arguing against spending money on energy efficiency investments, while nevertheless pursuing expensive new power plants. Um, ultimately, investment in low cost energy efficiency reduces the need for generation that offsets requirements for um, future power plants. It also provides a pathway for retirement of the existing and outdated polluting and expensive um, legacy fossil fuel plants, including over 53 gigawatts of coal plants that currently operate in the Southeast. All of this can be done while lowering customer bills, and there are many new technologies and ways of optimizing uh, the use of energy efficiency to uh, meet customer energy needs and to strengthen the resilience of our grids. Uh, ultimately, states and utilities should be investing in all cost-effective energy efficiency and energy optimization before spending customer dollars on more expensive power plants. So um, that concludes our summary of the um, Energy Efficiency in the Southeast 2019 Annual Report. Uh, we are looking forward to your questions and I think I'll uh, kind of hand it on uh, from here. Thanks, Forrest. And just to remind everyone, we do have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you can submit questions. And we've started compiling questions that have been submitted through that function as well. Maggie Schober is going to be moderating the questions for us today. So continue to submit any that you don't see being asked. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, that's Put in some questions. We've had um, quite a few come through, so uh, I'm excited to get this started. I'm going to start off uh, with a data question for you, Heather. Um, if you could give us a sense, this is from Simon Mahan, if you could give us a sense of the ease of data collection, uh, what utilities easily, accurately, and clearly provide strong efficiency data, and who are the laggards? Okay, um, so yeah, the data collection definitely varies from utility to utility, um, but I'll say that I've been pretty uh, pleased actually with um, how the Florida utilities file their reports with the commission. Um, it's really nice how they have, they report both um, savings at the generator and at the meter, um, so it's nice to have that point of comparison. Um, what else? Um, I think laggards, um, it can be difficult to get uh, data for TVA um, just because they don't file, you know, they're not really required by regulators to file reports like the rest of the utilities are. Um, they still have uh, an annual report that they publish and post on their website themselves. Um, but I think just the fact that they're not really required to do so, we don't know, they're not on a regular schedule like the rest of the utilities just kind of uh, bring some additional uh, difficulty into data collection uh, for TVA. So occasionally we do issue, um, you know, records requests uh, or something like that in order to get detailed uh, data on things like budgets for each program. Great. Thanks, Heather. Um, next one for you, Forrest. Uh, this is from Joy Kramer. What elements go into measuring energy efficiency? What, what do we mean by that term and how is it measured? Sure, that's a, 
a good question and, and it really is um, you know the, the kind of details behind the the utilities filings uh, to commissions into the Energy Information Administration. Um, there are a number of ways to evaluate achieved efficiency performance. Um, the first uh, thing to understand is that utility efficiency performance um, is measured above a baseline. So they're uh, typically are using um, the local building codes as well as uh, federal appliance standards, lighting standards, et cetera. So anything that uh, would be attributable in, in efficiency savings to, to those is not counted um, for utility companies. Um, the utilities that are doing the best in their uh, efficiency uh, performance tracking and reporting do what's called evaluation, measurement, and verification. There are a variety of different uh, techniques used for that. Everything from submetering, where there is a, a measurement of um, energy usage uh, performance on particular devices, um, you know, before and after uh, efficiency improvements are made, um, to you know, uh, sort of statistically uh, significant uh, random samples of uh, of individual customers who have participated and and having. Um, you know, auditors come back out and confirm that the, the savings uh, that, um, you know, one would expect uh, to come from the measures that have been installed uh, are, in fact, um, being delivered. There are even uh, assessments that look at um, the, the likelihood of customers making efficiency improvements were there not to be utility efficiency programs to address what's called free ridership. So there really are a lot of uh, detailed pieces and parts um, to that. Uh, we are seeing trends and, and technology is making uh, things possible that uh, did not used to be through uh, sensors and you know, wireless communication um, to increasingly measure you know, at the device or at the meter. Uh, but like I said, a lot of different techniques are used. All right, thanks, Forrest. Um, back over to you, Heather, and looking more specifically at North Carolina. Um, from For your North Carolina cal calculations, are you pulling data from the NC-RETS, NC Renewable Energy Tracking System database uh, that's overseen by the North Carolina Utilities Commission? Uh, the answer for that is no. Um, so we're usually we're using the actual filings, um, the kind of like rider applications that they file every year. Um, that's mostly for practical purposes because we usually submit testimony um, in those dockets. So it's kind of just easier to use the numbers that are filed um, directly, you know, directly in those reports. Um, it's been a while since I've taken a look at the efficiency data that's available on RETS, but I also can't remember if it has the same level of detail as far as, you know, a program by program, um, kind of like savings level and budgets, because that's also something that we're collecting data on. There also are um, benefits to looking at these annual regulatory filings because the savings are attributable to uh, specific, they're discrete incremental savings for a given year. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, moving over to Florida, we actually had uh, similar questions from a few folks. Um, Forrest, if you could just elaborate a little bit more about what happened in Florida between 20 and 50, 2014 and 2015. Um, why did the, the Florida Commission reduce the EE savings um, in that goal in that year? So uh, it's first important to trace even further back. Um, there was legislation in 2008 that uh, was reflective of then um, Governor Christ's expectations that uh, efficiency would be pursued more aggressively. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the commission has been using the ratepayer impact measure test. Uh, that, that is probably the biggest uh, factor um, between the, 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 the period from 2010 through 2014 and, and afterwards, where the total resource cost test was used um, in uh, setting targets uh, for, for those higher years. Um, there certainly was a, a concerted uh, political pressure uh, you know, campaign to, uh, to, to change uh, the expectations for utilities energy savings. And um, it 
was successful. So you saw that precipitous drop. Um, and yeah, it, it has to do fundamentally, um, there are you know, problems with the, the efficiency target setting in Florida. Um, we do not believe that is a problem of legislation. We believe that it is certainly a problem of uh, the utilities choices in, in what they present and the arguments that they advance, um, but it also uh, involves uh, you know, policy matters that are regulatory decisions before the commission. So the commission has the discretion uh, to emphasize uh, a different cost test, for instance, total resource cost test. They have the discretion to address free ridership and ensure that um, all customers are benefiting from efficiency programs. They can take different approaches than they have. And uh, yeah, that, that is really what has been um, the constraint and, and the, the explanation for the drop off. Thanks, Forrest. And keeping on that same subject of FICA in Florida, um, we have another question uh, that's a little bit more forward looking. Um, so it says, given Florida's recent decision on FICA goals and small chance of change in PSA mind PSC mindset for at least three more years, what are suggested actions to improve Florida utility performance in energy efficiency? Well, um, it's a very good question. So from the utilities side, um, many utilities have delivered efficiency savings results that exceed the targets in past years. And we see every reason for them to do so. Um, even with the targets being set as low as they are, it is a, a choice uh, that we believe the utilities have a, a great deal of, uh, of discretion around um, to deliver more robust programs and, and higher savings. Um, we also think that a very strong focus on efficiency programs for low income customers is warranted um, given the, the overall uh, lack of, of investment. Uh, it just is crucial that programs are being provided to uh, customers that, that struggle to afford um, energy bills and, and still need basic um, household necessities. Um, so uh, you know, I would say that that is uh, something that can be done. Um, I think that ultimately the, the question is, is framed uh, quite appropriately. Um, the, the commission's mindset is quite important around this. Uh, we do think there is a significant there's significantly more room to work with than, uh, than the commission has been um, been stating in, in their recent decisions. Um, but it is notable that the commission did push back uh, on the utilities proposals and, and rejected even uh, the, the staff recommendation um, to take those utility proposals. Uh, and ultimately, I guess I would say this is this is a little bit broader view on it. Um, but you know, I, I think that that action uh, in this most recent round of, of goal setting was in large part reflective of the 5,000 uh, individual comments that were filed by the public in this uh, most recent um, round of, of target setting, the, the proceeding, and uh, many cities uh, and counties that have clean energy and, um, and, and climate uh, compact um, commitments at the local level uh, really are recognizing that that their ability to meet those goals are going to be inhibited by the current um, state of uh, of efficiency investment in the state. So, you know, I think there is a, a a conversation about where the state of Florida, its people, its cities, you know, its businesses are, um, which is really not reflected in what we're seeing happening in, in Tallahassee right now. All right, thanks, Forrest. Um, taking a step back out of Florida for a minute. Um, Heather, we had a question about the 1% threshold. Can you go into a little bit more about, you know, what that means and how it's used and, and where it comes from? Yeah, yeah. So the 1% of prior year retail sales, um, it's not really like an official threshold and I don't think it was set by anyone in particular, but I think kind of the origins of that uh, were that it was, um, the target for kind of an early energy efficiency, um, like re, uh, 
resource standard uh, at the state level. Um, I think this was a goal that like a lot of, uh, you know, kind of energy efficiency advocates aimed for, but it wasn't really until um, some states set that and then achieved that, that it was really seen as possible. Um, and I know in the Southeast, it was kind of looked at as, you know, too difficult to really achieve on a wide scale. Uh, but I know Entergy Arkansas was the first in the region to actually do so. Um, and now that we have Duke Energy Carolinas also, um, you know, exceeding that threshold, it's just, you know, becoming more and more, it's seeming more and more possible to other utilities. Um, so it's, again, not really an official threshold or anything, but just kind of an aspirational goal. All right. Thanks, Heather. Uh, back to Forrest. Can you elaborate a bit more on the reasons for TVA's dismal performance and how can advocates most effectively pursue um, change at TVA? Almost where to start. That there are several things that, um, that that each are worth calling out. Um, I mentioned about the integrated resource planning. It is uh, you know it's inconsistent with what utilities that that really have um, you know made the most of, of efficiency are doing. Um, there are a lot of things that are you know very granular and technical that that were wrong about how uh, efficiency was analyzed in this IRP. But there are problems at the higher level. I mean, they just should not be acceptable um, to, uh, to marginalize efficiency in the way that that uh, was done in, in that most recent IRP. So that's, that's one issue. Um, a big issue is just the decision to slash the budgets. Uh, you know, TVA has a, a very unique situation where they, they do not have the classic uh, regulator, regulated utility relationship. Um, there is, uh, you know, I think a, an opportunity for the company to, um, to make decisions that could be good for uh, energy efficiency investment, but, but they've chosen to go in, in the other direction. So, you know, just slashing the budgets, eliminating rebate incentives uh, for customers, um, and, and even, in, in our view, underinvesting in low-income energy efficiency and, and creating requirements that uh, local utility companies come up with, you know, non-conventional sources of funds just to be able to access the limited dollars available is, is uh, you know, is an issue. Um, as far as what can be done, you know, at the end of the day, the, the local utility companies that are, are part of the TVA system uh, are contracting to buy power from TVA. And the more power they have to buy, the more cost is passed on to customers. And I think that there has been a, a perception over time that, uh, you know, that, that local power companies are, are very limited and, and constrained in what they can do with efficiency and, and have difficulty um, making their, their priorities around this known or pushing back on, on TVA's movement away from efficiency. And we believe there really is much more power at the local level. And, and I mean that, um, you know, in terms of, of the, the local power companies and, and the, the, uh, the actions that they could take and also the individual customers. And so I would just say what can be done, uh, undeniably the, the, you know, the most important thing is to be heard. Um, you know, if your local utility companies are hearing that this is a priority uh, for you, um, then it gives them additional um, motivation and, and frankly, it gives them, you know, I'd say some additional sway um, in, in their, uh, pursuit of, of higher efficiency. Um, and, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, these local, um, utility companies need to be advocating for their customers around energy efficiency to TBA. Thanks Forrest. All right. Um, moving back over to Heather. Uh, Heather, do you know of utilities sharing their uh, efficiency performance reports with local government customers or allowing local government customers to review the progress that they're having with their residents and commercial customers? Any examples of anything like that going on that you're aware of? Uh, I don't know if this quite answers your question, but the closest thing I could think of uh, would be that um, the city of Atlanta actually has a commercial energy efficiency ordinance where um, the, 
they're it applies to city owned and also um, private uh, commercial uh, buildings. Um, they have to do kind of uh, benchmarking for uh, building efficiency. And so uh, Georgia Power actually offers a data aggregation through their automated benchmarking tool. Um, but I don't think that's quite what you're describing. Um, I think one of the difficulties that um, would arise from a utility sharing um, kind of those performance reports with local go government customers um, is that, I mean, the way this question is phrased, to review the progress being made with their residents and commercial customers. So even though those residents live um, within, you know, that local government jurisdiction, um, the utility might have um, kind of an issue sharing that data if the request isn't being made by the customer itself. Um, so if you know, you're thinking of trying to approach a utility with such a request, um, it might be helpful to uh, make sure that you're requesting the data in an aggregated form. And that way the utility knows that you're not really asking for individual customer data, even if it is, um, you know, kind of scrubbed and um, anonymous. Um, it is kind of like easier to make that request if you're asking for data aggregation. All right, thanks, Heather. We're going to try and get through a few more. I don't think we're going to get to all the questions today, um, but you do see on the slide here is um, the contact information. So if you want to follow up after the webinar, um, please uh, use the contact information on the slide right now. Um, so next up for uh, for Forest, um, what sorts of things can utility companies do to increase efficiency and what makes Duke Energy so successfully in meeting its goals? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the first uh, thing I would point out is that energy waste and thus opportunities to find energy efficiency are all around us. Um, so really thinking of efficiency as an energy resource, recognizing that when it's less expensive, it is a better investment than building uh, or, or continuing to run outdated power plants that are more expensive uh, simply to, to power wasted energy. So that, that's the first thing as far as um, program design, you know, the, the kind of approach that is needed for utilities that, that are sincerely attempting to, to really harness the, the full potential of efficiency is turn over all of the stones. You know, really look in every uh, categorical area. Think of all the different groups of customers. So, you know, in most basic, you have commercial customers and industrial customers and residential customers. So, um, you know, not leaving any of those uh, out is, is important. And, and then beyond that, you have smaller segments of customers. So I mentioned, for instance, um, that mobile home and manufactured home residents, um, you know, are a, a group of customers that truly need and would benefit from efficiency. Uh, and yet you, you have few utilities actively um, seeking to, to provide programs uh, for those customers. So it's, it's kind of look high and, and look low. Um, I think there are a number of things that, uh, that you know, that, that explain Duke's uh, success in this area. Uh, some of them are internal. As I mentioned, there is, you know, clear um, management priority around this. There is staff that uh, is experienced across multiple states and, and overall a, a kind of approach to efficiency that uh, is, is looking for opportunities. Uh, you, you really do have instances of utilities blocking uh, consideration of of, um, of opportunities rather than than looking to to find them uh, efficiency it works it saves money it, it's great for so many reasons um, but it is also challenging it's not automatic just because efficiency is possible uh, that that it will get done and I think that's one of the fallacies some utilities seek to uh, to, to perpetrate is this notion that um, if efficiency was so good, it would already have happened. Uh, there is a very clear need and a huge benefit for having utility uh, efficiency programs. It prevents the need for paying for more expensive power generation. Uh, and it serves a unique um, uh, role 
distinct from what building codes, which is basically a floor, um, or appliance and lighting standards, uh, you know, provide. Uh, instead, providing uh, financial resources and and support uh, for people who are interested in reaching higher. So, you know, I would say that um, you know policy matters, um, company uh, commitment to uh, energy efficiency matters, and ultimately working with people who are proponents of energy efficiency to do the problem solving that's needed to design and deliver programs that will succeed. All right, great. Thanks, Forrest. I think we're gonna try to squeeze in one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, what near-term opportunities are there to improve efficiency in the region? Um, specifically, are there re regulatory proceedings or legislative activities that show promise? Well, one I, I noted uh, is Mississippi. Um, they have had pretty modest uh, efficiency performance in, in recent years. Um, passing integrated resource planning uh, was described as, as a clear step uh, towards reaching higher uh, with efficiency. So I would say that's one. The Carolinas, uh, particularly um, North Carolina for their emissions reduction targets. South Carolina, you know, sort of heading down that other path um, after the lessons from, from DC summer. Um, so you, you know, you've got opportunities, uh, particularly with, with Dominion, South Carolina and, and Santee Cooper. Uh, I'd say you know, in Georgia, Georgia Power, um, with that 15% increase, it's, it's incremental, it's a step, but it's a step in the right direction. And I think there uh, should be a greater opportunities with future integrated resource planning. And in Florida, um, you know, the commission pushed back when the utilities tried to slash efficiency goals further and, and they pointed to some specific uh, problems with the way they've been looking at efficiency, including the use of that rim test in the two-year screen. So, you know, I, I don't see that as happening uh, in, in, a, you know, in, in a flash, but I do think that there is um, the potential for uh, revisiting some of those policy matters and Florida being the largest state in the region, the third largest, most populous state in the country, uh, if there's movement um, in, in how efficiency targets are set in Florida, it could have a huge impact in the state and, and frankly, uh, for the region. Thanks, Forrest. So we're gonna go ahead and end the webinar today. Thank you everyone for participating and attending with us. We hope that you found the information interesting and informative. If you have any questions, again, you can take a look at your screen and you'll see contact information for Forrest, Heather, and Maggie. Um, we'll also have the recording to this webinar posted on our website shortly. If you haven't already, you can check out the webinar at our website, cleanenergy.org, and download it from there. We also have an accompanying blog that we released that kind of gives an overlay of some things that we talked about today and goes a little deeper as well. Thank you again for attending and have a great day.